Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I want to talk to you today about contentment. I want to talk to you about happiness, but it's more than just happiness. I want to ask you, challenge your thinking, I wonder where you are on the issue of how satisfied are you in life. There's never a reason for us to be complacent. Sometimes when you talk about contentment, people especially who are kind of alpha-driven kind of people, they take it as counsel that we should just be satisfied with the status quo, we should just coast, we should be complacent with that which is not ideal or not right. We are not advocating complacency. There are plenty of places in the Bible where we're called to pursue justice, where we're called to desire righteousness, where we're called to to serve others, to give of ourselves, and a complacent attitude causes us to ignore those commands. But at the very same time, A view of God as creator and Lord, rooted in the gospel, when we have that view, when we are grounded in that view of who God is and therefore who we are, it can produce within our hearts and lives a daily attitude of contentment, even in the midst of trouble, and even in the midst of things that obviously we wish were better or different, we can still find satisfaction. And of course, the quickest way to find out if you're content is to think about what makes you angry, to think about where your emotions get out of control, where you're either overwhelmed with discouragement and depression, or when you lose your temper. Contented people aren't angry much, right? And so the issue of contentment is really rooted to how we see life, and and I'm going to suggest to you today that one of the problems when we live discontentedly is we are living in dissonance to the way God made us. Because what we're going to see in our studies in Genesis this morning is that the God of creation made us very intentionally and very specifically and designed us in specific ways that, at the end of the day, keep Him at the center of our existence. And this is the whole message in the introduction. When you remove God from the center, your life is going to be out of tune. It's going to be out of step. It's going to be a dissonant kind of life. And some of you are nodding because I know you've experienced this. You've tried to pursue fulfillment in all these other kinds of things where God's insistence, and let me say it clearly, it is his insistence, not his advice. His insistence is that he be at the center. And so I'm being rather bold today. You want me to tell you your problem? You want me to tell you my problem? It is always, maybe I should say nearly always, but right now I can't think of exceptions. My overwhelming problems come, the problems that I can address, the problems that are not out there, but the problems that are in here, they come when I forget the fact that God is at the center of that he is to be the ground, the core of my existence. And when I'm diverted and distracted and chasing other things, I find myself discontent. I find myself not satisfied. And we find that truth grounded from the beginning. We're in a study called the Book of Beginnings, the Book of Genesis. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. And as you're turning there, let me remind you that In a sense, we have two creation accounts, but they're two different accounts of the same creation. So chapter 1 is an overview. It's the famous six days of creation. And it's a chronological laying out of how the infinite creator God made the world. And then in chapter 2, there is a close-up. Instead of an overview, there's a close-up. And instead of emphasizing chronology, chapter 2 emphasizes themes, And so we're working through chapter 2, we'll finish chapter 2 next week, but we're in the middle of chapter 2 today, and then we find chapter 3, which I'm calling a day in the life, and it's a dark day in the life of Adam and Eve, because most of us know what happens in chapter 3. And so chapter 1, you have the broad chronological overview, chapter 2, you have a zoom in or a close up, and then in chapter 3, you have a dark day in the life of our first parents. 
So this morning we are continuing in chapter 2 with some of the details of how the Lord God, the Creator, filled out His creation, how He built it out, as it were. And we're in chapter 2. Look with me, first of all, in verse 9, and then we'll skip down to verse 15. But look with me in verse 9. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, and I remind you today, as I do every week, this is God's word for us. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, and out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now go down to verse 15 and follow along. The Lord God took the man, Adam, took the man and put him in the garden. The word there is the idea of set him in the garden. He put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But this text has two important firsts in the Bible. It's the first reference to a command, although God has commanded existence, creation into existence, but the first word command, he commands Adam. It's also the first reference to death. And those themes hang, in a sense, like a pall over this text, because we know what happens in chapter 3, nearly all of us. And we'll get there in a couple of weeks. But as you read this text, and as we work through it this morning, some incidental questions begin to pop up. Some of them have already been bubbling up in our thinking. These incidental questions show up today and subsequent to this text. Most of them are complex, and most of them are mysterious, and some of them, I think, are unanswerable. But I just want to acknowledge them briefly in my introduction today. I just want to let you know that I'm not ignoring these, although I don't have answers for most of them. But I think we should acknowledge that these questions are here. First of all, in the specific text, how would Adam have understood you shall die? Most of you know that you've heard before the Hebrew is very literal, dying you shall die. If you eat of this tree, dying you shall die. Well, Adam didn't know about death. This was the pre-fall status of God's creation of Adam and Eve. And death, soulish death, at least, was not part of the existence yet. And death is not explained by God, at least not in the record. Perhaps God did explain it, but we don't know what Adam would have understood. The second question, just hang on for a minute, I'll mention it and move on, all right? The second question is, was Adam immortal? Because the New Testament says that only God is immortal. But if Adam was mortal, how are you mortal if death doesn't exist? What kind of mortality do you have if there's no death? We don't have an answer for that. There are no categories for us to understand what the pre-fall existence in Eden was like But that's a question that comes up. We'll revisit that before we're through. This leads us to all the what-if questions. Well, what if Adam had appropriately avoided the forbidden tree? What would have happened? Where would salvation have come from? What would have been the nature of our existence? And we have to acknowledge that those hypotheticals, we don't know the answers. But then that brings up an even deeper mystery that many of you have brought up already over the last few weeks, and that's basically, why did God allow this to happen? In fact, if God knew, and by the way, God does know, if God knew that Adam and Eve would disobey, as we're going to see in chapter 3, then why does God set any of this up? Why doesn't he stop it? In fact, those of us that believe in the absolute providence and sovereignty of God, we believe that it's not just that God allowed it, but in some sense, we are willing to say that God ordained it. Wow, that's a troubling one, isn't it? And if that's the case, how is all of this fair? And then we get to chapter three in a few weeks, and we're going to see that they chose to disobey, but where did that instinct come from? Because they were innocent and they were perfect. So the act of eating was the sin And yet, their desire that drove them to 
eat, is that a sinful desire? And I would suggest it probably is. And so where did that come from for people who were perfect? And then that raises the issues about where do our instincts and where do our desires, especially inappropriate desires, how are we to evaluate those? And that has even become a cultural issue in this day and time, especially when it comes to sexual desires. How do we understand all of these things? Now, those are a lot of questions. I'm not going to answer very many of them today. And some of them have been asked since time began, literally. And we'll see that some of them are even addressed broadly in the book of Genesis. One of the purposes of Genesis is to acknowledge the providence of God, even though our actions are sinful and meaningful, our choices really mean something, but God is still in control. You say, well, those things don't go together. If that's what you're beginning to think, then you're close to understanding it. It's a mystery. But back to our text this morning, what we find here is that chapter 2 in filling out creation, it shows that the Creator gives a, this holistic provision for our first parents. And by the time we get through with next Sunday, with chapter 2, here's what we're going to see. God meets their physical needs. God meets their spiritual needs and their spiritual connection. God gives them a moral component in their responsibility to obey, as we'll see today. And then next week, God gives them and meets Adam's need for a companion so he doesn't leave him alone. All of this in chapter 2. In fact, you come away from chapter 2 and here's what you get. Look how good God is. He provides for their physical needs. He provides for them in the sense of their spiritual needs. He gives them the breath of life. God also gives them moral responsibility, and God also meets their need, his need to address the issue of loneliness. And that's the reason Genesis 131, as a summary statement, says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, very good. Here's what we're going to find this morning in these brief verses. God gives sufficient purpose before the fall, he gives maximum freedom with minimum restriction. And before we're through, this is what I'm going to suggest to you, that even though the fall has tainted everything, that we still have sufficient purpose in life. And I'm going to suggest to you that we still have surprising freedom. And we also have reasonable restrictions. And we have a lot more responsibilities to say no than Adam and Eve had. But nevertheless, what we're going to find is that God empowers us and equips us to fulfill our moral responsibility before him as followers of Jesus. And the issue is, here's the rub today. This is what God has done for us. This is what God has provided. He's provided this this purpose for living, and we have this freedom and the abundance, and, and, and we, have, we have moral guidelines, we have guardrails that we have to stay within, and yet still we, we chaff and we squirm and we resist and often we rebel. And what I'm going to show you is that understanding God's purposes, understanding how God is at work, despite the fall, it helps us find satisfaction. It helps us keep God at the center because we know who God is and we know who we are. So with that, by way of a long introduction, let's look first of all in verse 15. And here's what I want to show you, that we can find contentment when we recognize our Lord God as the purposeful designer. He put us together. Look at it again in verse 15. Jehovah God, Yahweh God, the Lord God, took the man and put him, set, set him, or settled him as though to rest, set him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So Adam had a responsibility to care for, to maintain the garden. And this was not spiritual work, quote unquote. This was work in the world. This was a vocation. If you want to use this term, it was, quote, secular. And yet the truth is, these same words are used later in the Old Testament for labor in the temple and in the tabernacle. And I'm going to suggest to you that that implies that all of our work is sacred. That all of the labor that we do, it honors God. There's a sense in which we can say that our work is worship. Now, I'm going to grant to you, Adam's work was way different than our work. 
Think about Adam's job. He had no OSHA to deal with. He had no profit loss statements to fill out. He never went through a performance review. He had no two-hour team meetings, can you imagine? He had no HR department to deal with, no workman's comp, no competitors, no overtime. That was work for Adam. The fall changed all of that, right? But still, and Dave's been talking about this in our equipping hour, Still, work is an undiluted blessing because when we work, we are mirroring to some degree the image of God because God is the one who works in chapter 1. At the beginning of chapter 2, God rested from his work. And then he gives Adam a job to do. Work is appropriate. Work doesn't show up. Here's the main point. Work doesn't show up after the fall. Work isn't part of the curse. Difficult, toilsome work is part of the curse. If you're a farmer, thorns and thistles. This is what God says in chapter 3. The sweat of your brow. But before that, labor is something which honors God. And work is something in God's good design that he calls all of us to do. And when we labor and when we find productivity with our hands, with our energy, regardless of what it is, whether we get a paycheck or not, whether we're, we're clock, clocking in, or whether we have employees that we have to deal with, or whether it's, it's moms and wives caring for a home, whatever we do, the productivity of the image of God within us brings him glory. This is the way God has designed it. And the implication is, remember from Revelation, this will continue into eternity. Eternity is not unending retirement. Evidently, eternity and the new heavens and new earth represent ongoing, eternal productivity. That's a stunning thing to think about. This is what our purposeful designer has done. And let me give you the application for this this morning. What that means is this. You can still rest in God's good purposes. You can still rest in the fact that your designer, your creator, has designed you the way he intended to design you. And he has purposes for your life and in your career, or in your family, and in using your gifts, and in using your artistic abilities, in all of your circumstances, despite your family histories, because some of us, we've got some real stories in our family history, don't we? But nevertheless, God's good purposes are fulfilled as we honor Him, and as we live for Him, and as we labor, as we labor in ministry toward one another, as we labor to make a living, as we labor to provide for our families, as we labor to care for our families, all of this, when we do it nobly, when we do it appropriately, we yield God glory, and in a sense, we are reflecting the image of God. You can still rest in God's good purposes. This helps us know that our work matters, that, that art, artistry is a glorious thing, that giftedness is a wonderful thing, and even in mundane things of life, we can find contentment and satisfaction because we can know that, yes, as difficult as this circumstance might be right now because of the fall, as difficult as it might be, God has his purposes. What a glorious promise that is. We have a purposeful designer we can still rest in his good purposes. Well, secondly, in verse 16, we, not, we don't just have a purposeful designer, but we can come closer to contentment in our lives when we remember that he's also a generous provider. He's a generous provider. Look at verse 16. And once more, we saw this last week, we find his abundant provision. In verse 16, And the Lord God commanded Adam, saying, You may surely eat, <clears throat> eat. Excuse me. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. We see that back in verse 9, remember? Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. This is God's provision. Everything they needed, everything they wanted. And their wants, remember at this time, their wants were only right and good. And we especially see this with the tree of life, because evidently eating of the tree of life provided some kind of substance for Adam's pre-fall body. This was God in his wonderful provision, giving Adam, maybe that's the answer to his mortality, that his life was extended by the tree of life. We don't know. We don't 
have the answers to those questions. But here's the one thing we do know, especially when you think about the two special trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were symbols of Adam's dependence upon his creator. You want life? It's from the tree of life. And the knowledge of good and evil, it only comes from me, God was saying. Everything is derivative in mankind. Everything centers around God. Remember what verse 9 says? Those trees, where were they? They weren't on the outskirts of the garden. They weren't on some hill somewhere where Adam and Eve could look at the trees and think about what they meant. Where were they? They were in the middle of the garden, which was very likely God's way of saying, I'm in the middle and you're not. He is the provider. He is the one who has designed them, who has placed them there, who meets all of their needs. And recognizing that is a ground for orienting your life in contentment and satisfaction. You see, he's our generous provider. And we can find contentment when we still rest in his faithful generosity. His faithful generosity. He's our generous provider, and we rest in his faithful generosity. This is the ongoing enjoyment of all of his good gifts. And I mean all of his good gifts. You you don't need to worry. All right, I'm going to stop preaching and say something important, all right? That's sarcasm, but anyway. Some of us were raised with this sense that there are holy things, and then there are like carnal, worldly things. And the carnal worldly things, if you enjoy them, yeah, you could probably enjoy them, but you better be careful because you're going to get close to sin. But the holy things are the things that really matter. And this dichotomy of existence to where it it facilitated the idea that when we go to church, we're doing godly stuff, and then the rest of the week, we're kind of on our own. And we did the stuff we had to do, but if you enjoyed that, it was probably questionable because the only thing you really ought to enjoy was going to church. And some of you laugh because you were raised the same way. And what I'm saying to you is that all of God's gifts are to be enjoyed, and when we enjoy them, we give Him glory. I said I wasn't going to mention that football game that's happening today, and here I'm thinking about mentioning it. A few years ago, I made the mistake of of uh, commenting about the World Cup because America was playing in the World Cup. That's soccer. The rest of the world calls it football, but anyway. And I just, some, a guy left our church over it because I mentioned it in worship. And he just, I'm out of here because that's worldly. No, it's one of God's good gifts. If you love football, enjoy the game today. If there's something on the screen that's inappropriate, turn your eyes away. Enjoy all of God's good gifts. If you're smart, you'll have pizza in the middle of it. Enjoy God's good gifts. <laughs> because everything you enjoy that is not inappropriate and sinful in and of itself is a good gift from God. We need to teach our children this, particularly about sexuality, because we do so much warning about inappropriate sexuality, we can inadvertently send the message that somehow sexuality is a burden or is shameful. The truth is God is the one who created sexuality. It's one of his good gifts. So enjoy Starbucks coffee this week. You say, well, wait a minute, Starbucks, I heard they're devil worshipers and you know, they do this and that. I don't have to have the people that pour my coffee to believe what I believe. Just make me the coffee and I'll enjoy coffee as a good gift from God. Because he is our generous provider. And we can enjoy his faithful generosity. Remembering, watch this, remembering the giver. Remembering the giver. I'm tempted here to quote the the famous theologians from the 70s and 80s, the Eagles, who said... You can see the stars and still not see the light. And that's one of the problems. When you chase after the good stuff and forget the good giver. But when you remember the giver, God is delighted when you enjoy the good stuff. He's delighted. 
and confidence that he will meet our needs. Not necessarily all our wants, but his generosity overflows. And that's glorious. Well, the real challenge in this is verse 17. Would you look at it again? Look at the last part of verse 16. And we find here that not only do we have a God who is this masterful designer and he's a generous provider, but he's also a wise master. In verse 16 and 17, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, dying you shall die. Only man could transgress any moral boundary. And here's what we have to understand about this. Let me give you four general categories to think this through. And bear with me, because there'll be an application as we reach the end. The first is this. There's this test. God gives a test. The theologians call it man's probation. It's a test. And it's really an expression of raw sovereignty, of absolute sovereignty. This is God saying... I don't want to offend you, but this is God saying, because I said so. Remember as a parent, whenever you do that, because I said so. God doesn't give an explanation. God doesn't give reasoning. And, and you catch the contrast here. You can have anything but that tree. Why, God? Because I said so. But this was clear. He gives this warning that it was no trap, it was no trick. One, one author says it was a beautiful test in its simplicity. No one could be confused. Adam and Eve could never say, well, you didn't tell me, or it wasn't clear. There were no distractions. Look at the way God set them up. He set them up to succeed, not to fail. There were no other distractions, there was no disease, there was no aging, there was no sinful bent within their hearts, and they enjoyed God's presence, implied in chapter 3. What more could they want? God set them up. This is his goodness and his kindness. It was, listen carefully, it was one simple, clear reminder that God was God and they were not. God was God and they were not. And it called for a clear, decisive yes or no. They were to believe, they were to serve and work, they were to obey. God says, love me or go your own way. Make your choice. That's the test. Well, let me talk to you a minute about the tree. What was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Some people think, well, it had to do with if they ate the fruit, they would be aware of their sexuality. That can't be the case because God created and blessed sexuality. It didn't have to do with the body. It didn't have to do with the intellect because they had moral reasoning in giving the command. They could make a moral choice. The choice was the matter. It wasn't the body. It wasn't the emotions. It wasn't the intellect. It was the will. They had to choose. Now think about this clearly with me for a minute. There's no indication. There surely there was not an evil tree and a good tree. God had not made anything evil. There was nothing in the tree of the fruit, whatever kind of fruit it was. It it wasn't magic. There was no magic in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't, well, I'm going to eat this fruit and something inside me is going to happen. It was simply a test. One commentator on Genesis says it this way, in all this, the tree plays its part in the opportunity it offers rather than the qualities it possesses. Like a door whose name announces only what lies beyond it. That's the knowledge of good and evil. God could have just as easily said, see that stream, don't cross it. He could have just as easily said, see that hill, don't climb it. But instead he sets a tree in the midst of the garden and he says, see this tree, don't eat it. Don't eat of its fruit. So if you think about it, The tree itself was a demonstration of the knowledge of good and evil. They knew good. Remember what we've seen? Everywhere they looked was what? Good. And they knew evil. Good was to stay away from the tree. Evil was what? To eat of the tree. 
That was its purpose. Good was don't eat. Evil was eat. It was the knowledge of good and evil. That was the tree. We need to look at the penalty, though. Because it says, God is very specific, and God is sometimes critiqued over this, where it says, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But this language doesn't have to do with chronology or immediacy. It has to do with certainty. In fact, this was in the Old Testament. It was a sense of a death sentence. There's an example we have in 1 Kings where Solomon the king, the son of David, is dealing with issues of Shimei who had been involved in the rebellion against his father. And so we, without going into all the background, in 1 Kings 2, this is what we read. Solomon says to Shimei, for on the day you go out, he basically puts him under house arrest. He says, for on the day you go out and cross the brook Kidron, know for certain you shall die. Your blood shall be on your head. So that's a serious warning from the king of Israel. In 41, and when Solomon was told that Shimei had gone out from Jerusalem to Gath and returned, the king sent and summoned Shimei and said to him, did I not solemnly warn you saying, know for certain that on the day that you go out and go to any place whatever, you shall die. You see, on that day you come under a death sentence. This is what God is saying to Adam. You're going to come under a sentence of death. We still don't know what death meant to Adam. We, we still have a hard time understanding that. All we can say is, is that it was opposite of everything that he knew because all he knew was good. And wouldn't you think, just speculate here, wouldn't you think if the God of creation said, it's death, and it was clear that whatever God was saying it was contrary to everything good that you enjoyed. Wouldn't you think you'd have some awareness that you ought to stay away from that? Death is alienation or separation more than it is cessation or annihilation. Death is basically the separation of the soul spirit from the body but it's also separation of the soul and spirit from God and that's what happens immediately with Adam, indeed immediately. And yet God restores that, as we'll see. And everyone is born separated, alienated from the God of creation because of sin. And functional death happened because they were no longer able to eat of the tree of life, which evidently had rejuvenating effects for Adam in his pre-fall state. And that's what we find. We find that death immediately begins to unfold, and it continues all the way through the Bible, and it continues down to today. If you still have your Bibles open, just turn the page over to chapter 5 for a moment. And look at what we find in chapter 5. Look at verse 5. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he, say the word, died. Go down to verse 8. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he... And then go down to verse 11. And all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he... Verse 14. Thus all the days of Kenan was, were 910 years, and he... And on and on and on and on. You'll want to come back to the day I preached Genesis 5. It's a great sermon. <laughs> Matthew Henry said it this way. Your life will be, moving forward, a dying life. Your life will be, moving forward, God said, a dying life. We have a saying in our culture, dead man walking. Dead man walking. And I'm suggesting to you today that you can still find contentment and you can still find satisfaction, but you have to recognize that this is what happened and where we find these struggles and where we find these temptations and the frustrations and the heartache, it's rooted in this failure to pass this test with this tree and the subsequent penalty. But one more thing. Let me show you the point. The point of all of it. Because as creatures, Adam and Eve were to obey as opposed to acting autonomously. 
instead of making their own call, this is what their own call was saying, we will be our own master, rule, and Lord. No one will tell us what to do. And for them to eat, think about it, that's the only prohibition. For them to eat would reject God's prerogative to command. It implies this, we know better than God. We know better than God. And this kind of self-determination, it's diametrically opposed to discipleship, to following. It's self-made, it's directed. And where does it come from? We don't really have an answer for that with Adam. Clearly, Adam and Eve were tempted, as we'll see in chapter 3. But, but where does it come from? Many scholars and preachers looking at this text say, well, the point is unbelief. They didn't believe God's word. And that's surely true. Because if they'd known about death and they just ignored it, they evidently were doubtful of God's word. But I think there's more, something more fundamental here. I really do. It's not so much unbelief. It's the question of what do they treasure most? What do they treasure most? Do they treasure their designer, their provider, their ruler? Do they treasure their creator and a relationship with him? Or do they treasure their autonomy? Do they treasure their right to make their own choices? Their own wisdom? Listen, the essence of rebellion is treasuring self. And that's usually manifested with unbelief in God's word. Where's your treasure today? Here's the point. Even with the fall and sin and curse and all of it, you can still rest in God's sovereign wisdom. He's the wise ruler. And he has given us his wisdom, his rules, let's say it that way. He's the master, the wise master. And he's given us his wisdom in his word. And you can rest in his sovereign wisdom. The wisdom of God's revealed will, which we find today in the Bible. First John says it this way. The apostle John, who knew Jesus well, he writes this and he says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. If we think of the commandments as burdensome, we're missing the relationship with the one who gave the commandments. He's our wise, good master and ruler. And he wants, as he wanted for Adam and Eve, he wants for us the best for us. And I recognize there are a whole lot more commandments than Adam and Eve had to deal with. And there's a lot of heartache that they didn't deal with. And there's a lot of family issues. You know, Adam and Eve never had to get, get together and talk about all the dysfunction in their family. It never happened, right? But this is still our God. The designer, the provider, the master. And we can rest in his good purposes. And we can rest in his faithful generosity. And also in his sovereign wisdom, in his word, yielding to his word in faith. Despite tensions and temptations and stresses, Despite this proud, autonomous bent toward being independent, we can rest. That's really what we're saying here. If you rest in God, you're being dependent upon him instead of independent. I've told you so many times before, but let me remind you. Our greatest problem is our attitude to God, whether you're a believer in Jesus or whether you've not yet given your heart and life to Jesus, we still struggle with the same issues. And the same issues are basically where we say to God, God, I'm good. I'm good. God says, go this way. God says, I'm providing everything for you, but choose wisely and choose well and choose in a way that's holy. And we say, no, God, I've got this. I'm good. And for those of you who have never come to faith in Christ, you're insisting on being your own God. And you will find yourself before his judgment, bearing the weight of your own sin. Once you have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, your sin is taken away, but we live in relationship with God our Father, and it's like a, like a willful, proud son who has everything the Father gives, and has, he knows the wisdom of the Father, and he still says, you know what, I'm going to go my way. It's a way of heartache. 
This is the center. The core is our creator who has designed us well. Rest in that. He has provided everything. Enjoy his good gifts. But remember his wisdom that we find in his word. There are two trees. Two trees. The tree of life, which is a tree of promise and provision. Look to the future. But then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what we recognize now as we look back at that tree is that it was a tree which represented rebellion and unbelief and autonomy. Two trees. All the good that God had for Adam and Eve. And then at the other tree, everything thrown away. But you know what I'm here to tell you today? There's a third tree. It's not here in Genesis 2. But we know about that third tree. And it's a tree that matters to us. Remember what we read in Galatians 3? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. There's a tree of life. There's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which our first parents failed in that test. But then there's the cross which is a tree, and it's a place of substitution. It's a place of, of sacrifice. It's a place of forgiveness, and this is the heart of the gospel. This is the reason we say that our only hope is in the forgiveness that God gives, and he gives it righteously because our Savior took our place and paid our debt. The cross the ground of the gospel. And if you've never, in a real and personal way, put your hope and faith in Jesus, then you still bear your own guilt. You are still essentially living a life that is consumed with a statement to God that says, I'd rather do it myself. And that is a place of loss and a place ultimately of damnation. And I call you to repent and believe in Jesus to throw yourself on the mercy of the court. This is the gospel. And for those of us who call ourselves Jesus followers, this sense of contentment, this sense of satisfaction, sometimes it's fleeting, isn't it? Sometimes it's difficult to hold on to, to keep. But listen carefully. This text reminds us that the ground, the center, the core of our existence needs to be God and His glory and His will. That we are dependent on Him. We are not autonomous. We are not going off on our own. We are not chasing after our own wisdom. In fact, we are not only, we are not also, we are not providing for our own needs, but what we have is His generosity. And we don't need to push against the circumstances of our lives so much because He is in control. He has designed everything, including our gifts and abilities. And when we are discontent, when we are not satisfied, we're essentially saying, I've taken control of my life. I'll go my way. This is your takeaway today. Proverbs 3 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Some of you are looking at me saying, can't be that simple. Can't be that basic. I'm afraid it is. We have this God who is our good maker and our good provider, and he is our righteous ruler, our master. And when he's at the center, when he's our greatest treasure, when we trust in him and not lean on our own understanding, when we acknowledge him in all our ways, then he makes straight our paths. May this be so to God's glory. Let's pray together.
Father, it seems we have a choice a daily choice of whom do we choose to follow as our ideal parent. We can follow our first parents, Adam and Eve, who, as we will see in a few weeks, insisted on their own autonomy, their own kingdom, determining on their own what they would treasure. Or we can recognize our ultimate parent, you who designed us, who provides for us, and who gives us your law. Help us recognize that there's a very real sense we can never say ever to you, no, we're good. We need you. Overwhelm us with our dependence upon you and your wisdom from your word and the working of your Holy Spirit. Remind us of the beauty of the church as we need one another. And Father, remind us that a life that follows you is not without joy, but rather is the path to joy. That we can enjoy how you have made us, that we can enjoy the good gifts that you give in life and that we can find wisdom for living, sometimes challenging, sometimes against the grain of the culture, but nevertheless, what is best. Help us think through this morning, what is our greatest treasure? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.